So thank you all for coming. I introduced myself briefly earlier, uh, but my, my name is Matthew Spoke. Um, I actually, I remember speaking last year at DevCon in London, and I left that week in London feeling this really strange high from spending time with this community. Um, I was really like in awe of everything that was happening in this space, and I was pretty, you know, shook when I left, to say the least. Um, at the time, I was leading a blockchain technology team at a big consulting firm in Toronto. Now I'm not. Um, so I'm going to give my general caveat right now. For those of you in the room that work for a quote-unquote corporate, I will take absolutely no responsibility if you leave this week, quit your job, uh, jump into the blockchain ecosystem. There's many people who have done it. You wouldn't be the first. <laughs> um, so briefly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing at Nuco. Um, and then I'm going to move on. I'm, I don't want, I don't want to kind of get too repetitive with some of the things that we spoke about on the panel or some of the topics that Victor covered. Because, I mean, a lot of the problems that are being solved by various party, uh, companies in this space are pretty similar. I mean, we're all looking at the same restrictions and limitations of what needs to happen to Ethereum-based technologies to be really applicable in the enterprise space. Um, we heard from, you know, this, this panel specifically how the path towards some of these solutions and the path towards some meaningful enterprise adoption. And there's really some, some tremendous companies up here that were speaking earlier that I, I really admire. And I'm, I, I think the, the industry is in good hands if we can just look at the group of companies that are solving this. So Nuco, a little bit about us. Uh, we're a fully modular, customizable blockchain infrastructure uh, framework that is designed to enable uh, do the creation of domain-specific blockchain networks that can be optimized to solve specific problems, specific applications in specific industries. Um, so we've, we've essentially piggybacked off of the, the vision of Ethereum to create this, this, this framework, uh, to design a technology that can solve some of the pain and unattractive problems that we see in the enterprise world um, by bringing to it kind of a new lens of how do distributed systems change kind of the framework and, and operations of a large enterprise. Now, one of the things that I like to kind of reiterate over and over again, when I started in the blockchain space kind of two years ago, um, enterprises and large companies were kind of, you know, being framed as like the evil that needed to be removed from the world, and therefore we created Bitcoin and then Ethereum. Um, but I think it's kind of important for us to recognize that these are the companies that we rely on on a day-to-day -day basis. These are the companies that provide us services like bank accounts and insurance. And although it's sometimes frustrating to deal with them, there's an enormous opportunity to help these companies and these industries solve their kind of outdated systems. So that's kind of where we're putting our focus, is to really bring uh, these critically important services that we all rely on day-to-day -day into the modern world with new technology. Um, to do this, we're, looking, we're taking a slightly different approach. I mean, we looked at Ethereum as a technology that really is a public utility that, that everybody can use for pretty much anything, and we applied a lens of enterprise technology and enterprise infrastructure to it. So we, we kind of dissected the Ethereum stack and said, if I were to redesign this, asking the simple question of how would this have been built if it was built from day one as an enterprise technology? And so what does that mean at the consensus layer? What does that mean all the way up the stack of Ethereum so that it can really start to be meaningfully applied in an enterprise context? And that led us to some really challenging but important priorities that have essentially become the roadmap of what we're building. Uh, so for context, I didn't give you the full background. I mean, Nuco is a relatively new venture, as I mentioned. We used to, we kind of, uh, our initial core team started as a blockchain technology team at Deloitte. We, uh, we left and we started this company four months ago. We're based in Toronto, Canada. So some of the priorities that we decided to tackle, uh, you know, very similarly to the topics we were speaking about earlier, are things like scalability. So on scalability, we're focused on optimizing the availability of different consensus mechanisms into the Ethereum stack. So how do you obfuscate the consensus mechanism from the actual operation of the blockchain so that you can bring in an appropriate uh, consensus depending on the scenario that you're trying to solve for? So, you know, proof of work operating on the public chain or proof of stake in the eventual roadmap of Ethereum has its, its validity and a lot of value in terms of what it's trying to accomplish for a public network. But we think that in different contexts, with different numbers of participants operating different types of applications, there may be other consensus mechanisms that are better suited. So that's one thing on, on, on scalability. Um, we're also building to ensure that the technology that we develop is completely agnostic to server infrastructure, whether it be cloud or on-premise infrastructure. I mean, quite similar to what Victor mentioned, so that as we scale this and as we go into networks of companies that all today operate on different 
traditional infrastructure, some of which are moving into the cloud and they'll have different cloud providers. How do we make sure that the, the connectivity between these different infrastructures is solved using a blockchain? That we can solve things like P2P latency when we want transactions to move seamlessly around the world. So that kind of leads us to performance, which is obviously an enormous reason why large companies have run into restrictions when they want to use Ethereum to do anything. Um, in certain contexts, if you think of like a very simple example, high frequency trading in a financial market, it's pretty obvious that running that on the public Ethereum network would, would cause problems, just because of the, the sheer nature and, and size of transaction throughput that you would need. So on performance, we've got kind of two parallel focuses that we're working on right now, starting with a suite of high performance uh, throughput APIs uh, to kind of complement or be alternatives to the available Web3 API that you can find or that you can use for the public Ethereum network so that we can get closer to that enterprise level transaction throughput that's necessary for a lot of these use cases. We've also designed and we're soon starting the process of implementing enterprise modifications at the VM level so that we can start looking at parallel transaction processing for smart contracts when it makes sense, when transaction dependencies are at a state where there are not too many of them depending on the application, depending on the industry so that we can really crank through the performance that's necessary on these networks. Now overall, when, we're, when we identify kind of priorities for our, for our development team, for our engineers, we kind of go back to some very simple design principles. Um, and you know, when, you, when you consider the enterprise market, the biggest thing that I kind of look at is their need and expectation of technology maturity. And as much as it's incredible to watch what's happening in this space, we all can recognize that this is an extremely nascent space. And nascent technology scares large enterprises because there's unanswered questions and unsolved problems. So we're trying to bring a lens of uh, enterprise maturity. So that means that when possible and when relevant, bringing in existing enterprise frameworks, existing enterprise languages, and existing enterprise tools, and making them a meaningful part of a blockchain infrastructure so that it's a more familiar and seamless transition when we go to make that infrastructure change. So our goal, as I said, is to make blockchains a very evident and obvious next step in how do we make infrastructures of the past get replaced with infrastructures of the future. You know, digital infrastructure and the, replacing, the replacement of legacy systems in large companies is not a new topic that was introduced just because blockchains showed up on the scene. But blockchains, as we all know, are kind of an evident tool that needs to be included in how we do that redesign. So, you know, the more we can make that seamless and obvious, the, the better off it'll be in terms of the transition for these large organizations. Now, as we all know, uh, and we constantly hear this from innovators in this space, there is an enormous amount of opportunity. Everybody who's here in this room, although Ethereum is kind of at that state of no longer being an infant and probably being more of a toddler right now, and there's this enormously growing group of developers that are kind of being aggregated around this technology, we're still the pioneers. You know, everybody in this room that's working on a project is a pioneer, and there's a ton of opportunity for everybody to carve out interesting markets and interesting use cases that maybe nobody else has thought of. But I suspect I'm not the only one who really thinks about this and gets excited by this, but also gets equally terrified by this. Because the, the nature of those ambitions is not, you know, what a typical kind of app developer might be looking at when they want to accelerate your food delivery. We're talking about changing how people interact with each other, how organizations transact with each other on a global basis. And it's important, but it's also critically important that we get it right so that we need to slow down and kind of bring, bring that enterprise maturity to this market. Now I can tell you how easy it is um, to easily become dissuaded by the size of the ambitions that this industry is going after. I mean, when we look at like, you know, in, in our case, just looking at the nature of a small team trying to tackle big global problems. Um, but I'll tell you what it is that motivates us at Nuco. I mean, we're a small local startup in Toronto, you know, 10 people operating out of a, a startup office going after these globally Im uh, impactful ambitions, and I think the simple reason that we can do that is because there's a vision in this community that kind of drives us. A vision of global change, a vision of, of deep impact that really will, will touch unreachable, previously unreachable populations on Earth that now the new technology can kind of unlock. So in some cases, I mean, having the financial reach of these large companies to be able to just dump 50 engineers onto a new project is helpful, but in most cases, I actually think that the meaningful change is gonna happen from small teams like the ones represented here from small companies of developers kind of operating in garages or kind of back offices saying, we have an idea, we're gonna change something. And I think the reason is pretty clear. I mean, I came from the enterprise world um, where you know, instability and uncertainty scares people tremendously. 
And anybody who's been in the blockchain space long enough knows that if you're scared of instability, you won't last. I mean, all you have to do is look at Bitcoin over the last seven years, or even you know, more relevant to this audience, look at Ethereum over the last four months, or Ethereum over the last three days. I mean, there's always reasons to get nervous and scared. And that's why I'm confident and absolutely certain that it's going to be small you know, startups and, and community-driven uh, campaigns that really make change rather than large-scale enterprises. I mean, that said, I have no, um, no hard feelings for the large-scale enterprises. I came from Deloitte. I spent five years there, and I think there's an enormously important role for those companies, uh, as, as Victor mentioned. You know, integration and adoption by large enterprises in education is going to be a problem that everybody needs to kind of tackle together. But the future of this technology really is be going to be determined by groups like this, groups like us. So we see the inefficiencies of these large companies as an opportunity for a new business model. And we envision a future where, unlike some of the rhetoric of the early blockchain days, we want to allow people to get the services they need from the companies they trust. Rather than just cutting these companies out of the equation, really helping them redesign their processes to make it better. Now to do this, we're aiming to become a provider of infrastructure, simply put. And we want that infrastructure to be leveraged not only by these big organizations, but also by smaller kind of application-driven teams that have an ambition to change something in the, in the industry. So our, our expectation is that if you have an idea that is really enterprise-driven and you need an infrastructure to power that idea that can be well-suited for kind of the requirements and specifications of an enterprise market, we'd love to be working with you. So, I mean, by all means, please reach out to us, get to know us. Uh, if you ever decide to do the Ethereum pilgrimage and come back to Toronto where it all began, uh, you know, not so many years ago, let us know and we'll, we'll host you while you're there. 2016 has been a really interesting year, and I'll spend maybe a minute just kind of looking back at what happened since I spoke at DevCon last year. I've been referring to this year as kind of the year of the blockchain proof of concept. And not just because of the number of prototypes being built, but also because the mainstream world is now looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum with a lot more interest and saying, does this stuff actually work? But I don't think we're the only ones to be frustrated by the fact that POCs can seem to be an endless cycle of not getting anywhere an endless cycle of not understanding how you can actually make meaningful change. So as exciting as this trend is, we need to figure out how to get beyond this type of R&D work and into real production work. And I'm confident that that's on the verge of changing, and we're making sure that, that Nuco is kind of ready to get there. Now I'll give you kind of one closing thought, because I know it's the end of the day and it's been the end of the long week, um, but I want to kind of encourage this community if I, if I can do that from my perspective. I mean, last year I talked about the floodgates kind of opening and the mainstream attention kind of dumping into this space because there was 400 people sitting in a room in London and not many people outside of that room had heard about Ethereum before. I mean, I exaggerate, but the mainstream world hadn't really heard about Ethereum. And for those of you who have been involved in this space long enough, you know that that's completely changed. We've seen companies get funded and founded and projects being launched over the last year that have really thrown Ethereum into the spotlight. I think we've probably seen the Ethereum community grow by 10x over the last year. It's easily become the most readily available and most used technology in R&D labs around the world. It hit its $1 billion milestone this year, which is tremendously valuable for this community. <laughs> and, and not to understate, Vitalik turned 22 this year. I mean, that's a big uh, milestone year. <laughs> so quite the year for Ethereum. But we also learned some lessons this year. I mean, I think we also realized that there are challenges that we hadn't necessarily anticipated, challenges to decentralized governance and the difficult task of dealing with diverse groups that have diverse interests, and how do we properly solve that? And we realize that there are challenges that are legal and regulatory that apply to token systems, and challenges with the development of like secure enterprise software, or Ethereum-based software. But I think all of this points to kind of a productive year for Ethereum, and kind of a, a very uh, positive looking year ahead, and I'm really looking forward to being here next year. Um, so I, I, I'll just leave you with that, and I mean, before I wrap up, because I am the last presentation of the day, uh, I thought it'd be worthwhile to maybe do a quick thank you and round of applause to Ming, Vitalik, George, the Ethereum Foundation. Um, I didn't want to steal your thunder, Ming, but you probably wouldn't have thanked yourself, so. Thanks, Matt. No problem. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys.